Every Sunday, in the second Sunday of Lent, each year we hear this story of the Transfiguration, Jesus taking his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and all of us to the top of Mount Tabor. And there he gives us two lessons so that we might live our Lent well. Jesus took his disciples up a high mountain not to sightsee, not for exercise, but to pray. Jesus was constantly going apart to pray, and on many occasions, he brought his disciples with him. On this one occasion, we see what happens as Jesus prays. He becomes transfigured in the sight of his heavenly Father, and he begins to converse with Moses and Elijah, who were, respectively, God's instruments for giving the law to the Israelites and the greatest of all prophets who announced the coming of the Messiah. Moses and Elijah were no strangers to praying on mountains. Moses' face had become radiant after praying to God for 40 days and 40 nights when he was on Mount Sinai. In fact, his face became so bright that he had to cover it with a veil. Elijah becomes transfixed by the whisper of God's voice through a gentle breeze on Mount Horeb. And the evangelist tells us that the subject of their prayerful conversation was the exodus which Jesus was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Just as Moses led the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt through the Red Sea and the desert to the Promised Land, so now Jesus would inaugurate another exodus. He would inaugurate another Passover, leading his people from bondage through sin, through the waters of baptism, and the death, desert, to the place of eternal life. And in the midst of all this, Peter interrupts the conversation, and he says, Lord, it's good that we are here. And then he offers something that's really quite strange. He says, let me build three tents here, one for you and Moses and Elijah. This was a tent not to give them any kind of comfort, but a place where they could dwell permanently. Peter was really taken with this vision and hoped it would last more than just a few minutes. But before Jesus could even answer, a bright cloud overshadows them and God the Father spoke from the cloud. Now that phrase, God the Father speaking, happens only three times in the whole New Testament. So I think that when the Father speaks, we're supposed to pay attention. The first thing that he says is he establishes Jesus' identity. This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. The Father proclaims the divine sonship, the same truth that Jesus would later proclaim and receive accusations of blasphemy from the chief priests and the scribes. Thus, this eternal Father of so few words gives us a startling imperative. He says to Peter, James, and John, listen to him. Now that might be a bit confusing, because after all, hadn't these three disciples been with Jesus already for two years, hearing what he said in synagogues, preaching on mountainsides, teaching from the boats, and doubtless said to them hundreds of things in private conversations during their daily journeys. But the Father knew these disciples well. They had selective hearing. They were particularly tone deaf to some of Jesus' challenging words, like the words he had spoken just before this scene of the Transfiguration, when he told them that he had to go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and those other teachings. If you want to become my followers, that you have to deny yourselves and take up your cross and follow me. God the Father was telling them not to ignore these, cru these crucial truths that Jesus was teaching about himself and about them if they were to be his disciples. So Lent is a time that Jesus takes us by the hand and he leads us to Mount Tabor. 
And not only do we see him transfigured, but because it is Lent, we too are changed. We too can be transfigured. Lent is a time when we're called to increase our quality and quantity of our time with Jesus. And we need to build a space for him and for others in conversation and prayer. And there's another lesson in all this. Notice that the disciples liked this experience at the mountaintop and they wanted it to last a while. But Jesus comes over to them, taps them on the shoulder and says, don't be afraid, get up, let's go. And he takes them down the mountain back to mingle amongst the crowds. Every Lent, Jesus comes to us when we're very comfortable in our place. And just like Peter, James, and John, he tells us, come on, let's go. He wants to lead us from our comfort zones elsewhere. This Lenten progression that God wants from us is shown very clearly in our first reading today. Abram was 75 years old, well established in Ur of the Chaldeans, living in his paternal home, was well respected, and was very wealthy. But the Lord says to him, go from your own country and from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now, Abram could have concocted a myriad long list of excuses, but he didn't. He packed up his home, his family, his animals, his entire life, and he left. He had no idea where God was going to take him, but he trusted in the Lord and he followed. He had no inkling that God would really shake up his life when 10 years later, he and his wife, Sarah, conceive a son. 14 years after that, God takes Abraham on an even steeper climb of trust up to the top of Mount Moriah, where he's asked to sacrifice his son back to God. But Abraham, out of a trusting faith in God, willingly ascends again. And on every occasion, Abraham's faith, his hoping against hope, was rewarded, and God gave him more than he could have ever anticipated. This Lent, the Lord comes to us wherever we are comfortable in our place, and he says, go up and go to the land that I will show you. He asks us to trust him on the same journey and to follow him with the same kind of trusting faith that this man Abraham had. Like Abraham, we may be old. We may have many dependents. We may have a multitude of excuses, but God calls us on a journey. He doesn't tell us what type of battles we're going to encounter, nor does he indicate the destination to which he's leading us. But if we really trust him, we don't need to know. The central truth is that if Abraham had not trusted God and left Ur, he would have never seen the promised land, nor become the father of many nations. If Moses, at age 80, and the Jews in Egypt had not trusted God enough, they would have died as slaves in Egypt and never experienced God's great manifestations his saving power and love. And if the apostles had not left Mount Tabor and gone with Jesus up to Calvary, they would never have witnessed the depth of his love or been able or capable of being witnesses to the ends of the earth. Every Lent, we are called to leave our comfort zones and with faith follow the Lord to the place where he shows us Every Lent is meant, too, to be a Tabor experience for us, in which we climb with Christ to an experience of mutual transfiguration in prayer, and then descend with him to walk the way of the cross to another mountain. And on that other mountain, Jesus' clothes will not be dazzling white, but will be taken from his body. And instead of his face be gloriously transfigured, it will be gaunt, and his head crowned with thorns. He will be conversing not with Moses and Elijah, but with two thieves. It's to that mountain and the glory on the other side of it to which he leads us every Lent. 
Jesus comes to us personally today and invites us, get up, let's go. The question is, will we have the courage and the faith to follow him all the way?